each week keeps getting, it seems like, worse and worse. That's what I'm going through right now. Uh, but if God allowed it, then who am I to complain about it, right? There must be something going on. So probably share it through a sermon as we work through this uh, right now. Got to keep my mouth shut and stay in the fight, right? Yeah. Best place to be is in God's house. So um, we want to welcome you to Olivet Baptist Church and uh, Sunday morning worship. Those of you online, um, we are in a series on the cross, and if you're joining us in person, obviously you already know that. I um, want you to join us in our corporate worship. So if you're sitting on a couch, sitting in a chair at the kitchen table, feel free to do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. We just want to show God love and let him know that and sing praises to our Savior. So young people, again, I'll say it. These three songs, listen to the words. Wes? Good morning. Our Old Testament scripture comes from Psalms 134. Psalms 130, find these words. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who ministers by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Our New Testament reading come out of Revelations, the third chapter. Our New Testament reading. And the writer writes in third chapter, 20th verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. May the word of God dwell richly in your heart and soul this morning. <clears throat> oh God, as we come and we do our period of devotion, Lord, we feel, the Lord, that your spirit is tapping on our hearts as we seek you today. We pray, Lord, that you will receive us and receive our prayers and receive our supplications this morning. But Lord, most of all, we come, Lord, to praise you and lift you up. We thank you that we can come to you. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. But we come, Lord, to have a spiritual field service, Lord, that you are praised and that you are uplifted, that you're given all the praise and all the thanks for all the things that you've done. Even though we're trying to make it through these things that we have, you're always with us. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, as we lift you up in our giving and lift you up in our prayers, and lift you in all that we do today. May you be glorified and given all the praise. In your sons that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's continue in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, <clears throat> we come this morning, Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for the worship service. We come to you right now, Lord, asking you to forgive us for all of our sins. Heavenly Father, allow us to concentrate on you and you only. Your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come first thanking you for who you are. You are God Almighty, the one and only true living God. We recognize, Heavenly Father, that you are a awesome God. Heavenly Father, you are the one and only true living God. Heavenly Father, you are our maker. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. You have provided us an opportunity for salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Oh, gracious God, and we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have the realization of who you are and who your son, Jesus Christ, is. And so we come right now, Heavenly Father, bow down. Thanking you, Lord, for, for all that you had done for us. You have blessed us time and time again. Heavenly Father, you blessed us with another day. 
Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with another opportunity in worshiping you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to listen to Reverend Ananias, who's going to preach the gospel this morning. Oh, gracious God, we just say thank you, Lord, in anticipation of what we're going to hear this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, we sing thy songs to you. We lift up our praises to you. We lift our hands to you, Heavenly Father, and we recognize that you are God. And thank you, Lord, for being who you are. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Thinking moments. By the way, Wes, great choice of songs, man. Loved it. Um, did you look at the video from last Sunday on Thinking Moments? Did any of you get a chance to follow up on it? If you haven't, I would highly encourage it. That was the interview from Berkeley with uh, 25 to 28 year old white students and then going to Harlem and interviewing uh, those in Harlem, asking them the identical questions. It's sort of comical. But I would advise you to do it if you haven't. Talk to me afterwards. I don't want to rehash that one. But we do have some thinking moments. Um, so I knew it was coming. I told you it was coming. And it has happened. So here we go. Transgender men, again, wanting to get involved in female sports. So now we have a male. And the biblical principle is God made man and woman. Two separate entities. Now we have a mixed martial arts fight. And we have a guy who wants to be a woman, and he's fighting a woman, and the results were that he broke her skull. That happened last week. So now my question to the feminists is, where are you? Talk about equality and inclusion and diversity. Something's wrong here. Do you see the problem when you violate God's principle? It becomes a mess. Got another one. The Bible says that man is a free thinker. He can share his ideas. Well, Twitter has said they're going to roll out during the uh, 2022 November elections a specific uh, item called election misinformation. They're going to monitor it on what they think is misinformation. What's that called? Just a thought. And the last one, well, next to last, the school board in Fargo, North Dakota, has canceled, this was on TV uh, two nights ago, canceled the Pledge of Allegiance before their board meetings. Okay. But I told you this would happen. The reason why the chairman said that he said that he does not believe in the phrase under God. Oh, and he said, I'm a socialist. Socialists are atheists. That political ideology means they're coming for the church in you. Just a thought. And the last one to me is comical. It's the educational system. I don't know about you, but I have never heard of a six-year-old ever saying they are anxious about climate disaster. But voila, front page of the California section of the LA Times, and then the second page, and it has these kids doing this. Now, I've never heard it. Doesn't mean that it's not true. But I'm a little concerned. I thought education was to educate in reading and writing and political issues at six? Come on. Who are we playing with now? Anyway, just a thought. And no wonder our educational system is at the bottom worldwide. That's interesting. All right. Thinking moments. Uh, probably get some taxes on that. Uh, good ones. All right, let's go before the Lord. 
it's the better place to be in light of the thinking moments. And I'm going to ask you to do something a little different again today. We're going to look at the names, as we always do. Last two Sundays, I had you ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance as the real counselor some of the secret sins, secret behaviors that we don't talk about. Bring them up to the forefront so you can confess them privately. What I'm going to ask you to do today, something close to it, I'm going to ask you, when we get to this point, I'm going to read the scripture that reinforces it. Sometimes as believers, we have weights that we carry that hinder us in our walk. They may be sins or they may be things that we put as a priority that shouldn't be. So when I get to that point, I'm going to ask you quietly to ask the Holy Spirit if you have any of those weights. And if he tells you, yeah, that's one, that's one, that's one, then ask him to help to remove them. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let's go before our Lord. I'm going to read this one verse on the names of God, and then we'll go through another five of them. It says, may his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Psalm 72, 17. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you. Thank you that you know our name. Thank you that we can have an assurance that even if we have to stay in the trial, you're there. You've allowed it. You'll be with us. You'll lead us out in your timing. Thank you that you're a God who by the very over 800 names give us insight into your nature and how you behave. So here we go again with another five, Lord, that demonstrate who you are. Psalm 100, verse 5 says, You are the God that is loyal always and ever. Well, that's a character trait that is not usually found in 2022. You're a God who is loyal always and ever. That you stand by the very promises that you make. We want to praise you for that. A God that we can trust. A God that doesn't move around. A God that says truth is absolute, not relative. Revelation 1.5 states that you are a loyal witness. Hosea 14.8 describes you as a green fruit tree, a luxuriant fruit tree. Psalm 43 verse 4 calls you the magnificent God. Hebrews 4.14 states that you are the magnificent king priest. And Matthew 3.11 states that you are the main character in this drama. Ah, let me say that one again. That our God is the main character in this drama. What a savior. Now Hebrews 12.1 tells us to throw off everything that hinders. Everything that easily entangles. It may be sin, but it may be something that entangles us in our walk so that we can't run with perseverance. Now, Holy Spirit, roommate, 
third person of the Trinity who lives inside me. I'm going to ask it for me, but I'm asking it on behalf of others that are listening and that are present as well. In these next few moments of silence, Holy Spirit, would you do what you do best? You're the counselor. You see my heart. I can't lie to you. So would you shed light for me? those things that hinder me from running the race with perseverance. I don't want to be the type of Christian that limps along. Not when you said I can run the race and persevere. That means a no quitting. And God, I was thinking the other day as you were ministering to my heart in this area, any pleasure better than my prayers is an issue. Any book better than your Bible to me is a hindrance. If I find myself beginning to love any house better than your house, it's a hindrance. And if I love any table better than the Lord's, it's a problem. If I love any person better than my Savior, I have another weight. I love anybody, anyone better than my soul. An alarm better go off. And if I love any present indulgence better than the hope of heaven, help me to get rid of it. So now, Lord, we come before you, and Holy Spirit, the Counselor, you live with me. You know me better than anybody. Would you do your work now for me and for those that have a desire to drop dead weight as they run the race? and fix their eyes on Christ, our Savior. Holy Spirit, thank you. You do a really good job. You have a way of bringing stuff to the forefront that we forget about. Or that we like and think it's no big deal. It doesn't slow us down in our running the race. And yet you just now have displayed your relevance, your existence in our lives, those of us that are believers, by counseling us. How relevant is that? 
And we're asking you, Father, to forgive us for these weights that we think are important. Help us now to move you to center stage so we can run. not be slowed down by unnecessary things that we thought were important. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll turn it over to the officers now as we take the offering. Thank you, Wes. All right, ready to go to work. Let's do this, okay? Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to, again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. If you're visiting online with us, this is message number 5 on our topic, the cross, part 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. I'm reading from the NIV version. And here's what Paul is writing as he closes out the letter to this Galatian church. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, again, uh, we're, you're the author. We're coming to you asking for you to do what you've always done week in and week out for us. And that is to take the very words that you pen through holy men of God, written by your direction. And illuminate it. You're the author. You've signed the book. So now, help us to better understand it. Help us to get behind the cross and understand a plethora of truth. Where before we just looked at a glance. And then take it and let us fall more in love with the Father and the Savior and you because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, in Galatians 6, 4, we've read it now five Sundays. Paul's going to do something. He's doing it, actually. He's wearing his colors. This guy has got a handkerchief. It's red. He's got it in his pocket. He doesn't care about chic appearance now, about what is in, in clothing. He's letting people know where he stands. And that red handkerchief is symbolic to the cross and the blood of Christ. He's giving his personal position and he's doing it We've already found out by contrasting himself to these fake teachers that only took 19 years to get in there. And these individuals were boasting about their works, their flesh, their success, and they're called the Judaizers. They said, oh, you, you all want to believe in Christ? Do it, but you need Christ and the law, which is works. And now Paul is contrasting himself, comparing himself with them. And he's saying, they can boast in that. But as for me, may I never boast in anything but the cross of Christ and him crucified. So what have we said so far in four weeks? This is just sort of bringing us up to date. Well, number one, we've said the cross and our response to it will determine our eternal destiny. Every human being who looks at the cross has got to go through it one way or the other. They can deny it and walk away or accept it and have eternal life. Whatever decision they make, their eternal destiny will be determined by that decision. That's huge. We said that in the beginning. The second major thing we said is it's the cross is the most magnificent incredible event in human history and nothing will ever match it nothing and what what makes it so magnificent is you have an eternal god that never dies die and that's a mystery how do now you and i dying i get it we're dying 
But here's an eternal God who never has died, always is, and yet dies for you and me. And, and why did this ever really happen? We want to get behind that. We want to look at some things. A casual glance at the cross isn't going to do it. Reading 1 Corinthians 11 during communion isn't going to give it to us. What made these men nail Christ to the cross? They're Romans. They don't know the Old Testament. What made them do it? What did Jesus do? He wasn't a political activist. All he did was good things. Why would a person who only does good things get nailed to a cross? That's what we want to see. And that leads us to our theme, the wisdom of God. Roman numeral number one. Why is the Son of God there on the cross? And you go, oh, well, because a man sins. I want to get ahead of, behind that, way before that. Why is he there? Letter A will start to give us a little more information. So here we go. First, it's not merely the action of men. It's not merely the action of men. Well, wasn't it men that nailed him to the cross? It was. That's not the real reason. They're the conduit to get it done. But there's something else going on that led to them to do it. That's what we want to look at. And we see part of our answer in Isaiah 53, verse 7b. Second part of the verse. Isaiah 53, verse 7b. Second part. Here's what the prophet stated. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is silent. Now, what's interesting about that verse, it was written between 700 and 680 B.C. Oh, now this opens up something. So now in 700 to 680 B.C., when the prophet Isaiah penned this concerning the Savior, it was way ahead of the actual event. In fact, under Isaiah 53, you have letter A. It's an exact prophecy. It's an exact prophecy of what happened on the cross way ahead of time now that should pose our mind to start thinking now number two psalm 22 another proof text in the old testament psalm 22 verse 1 22 verse 1 let me read it for you my god my god why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Now this psalm was written between 1410 and 450 BC. So we're still way ahead of the birth of Christ, and we've got, and again, under 2a, a prophecy of the death of our Lord on the cross. A prophecy of uh, the death of our Lord on the cross. And I only gave you two. There's way more than that. Isaiah and Psalm. So now we've got a statement made by God way ahead of time, that said the Savior's going to die on a cross. Hmm. Maybe it wasn't just those guys. Maybe something else is happening. Let me give you a third proof text. Leviticus and the books of the law. Leviticus and the books of the law. 
Nobody reads Leviticus anymore. I, you know what? I've never heard a preacher preach out of it. But let me give you, it was the dates of this one now. It was written in 14, between 1445 and 1405 BC. And all I want you to do is the book of Leviticus is an instructional manual on worship and sacrifices. Oh, and it's only for the Jewish people. So here you have a book that tells those that know God how to worship and what to sacrifice. And it's a foreshadowing of the sacrifice and what Christians should be doing and how they should work and worship. Do you see it? So now we, we even have the church etiquette on worship and sacrificing in the Old Testament, and it's a foreshadow of the sacrifice that's coming in the new. So maybe it wasn't these guys, ultimately. Number four. Actually, let's go to number five first and go back up to four. Numbers 21, verse 9. You'll see why I'm doing it. I made a mistake in the outline. In the order. 21, Numbers 21. You can jot it down uh, and, and just listen if you'd like. 21, verse 9. Let me give you the backdrop. Got these Jews complaining. <laughs> now they're going to Moses and saying, you know what? This is a blankety blank blank. We're in the desert. You're going to kill us. We, why did you take us out of Egypt? What are you doing? Now God gets upset. And he gives them snakes in the desert, and the snakes bite the believers, and they start to die. Then they go, whoa, forgive me, God, I'm sinning. I should have never said that against your prophet. I should have never said that against you. Will you save us? And now verse 9. So Moses made a bronze snake. And put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Okay, now let's go to number four. John 3, 14. John 3, 14. And watch what Jesus is saying about the quote in Numbers 21, John 3, verse 14, and here's what he says. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, that's Numbers 21, we just read it. So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, that statement that happened in Numbers 21, that's me. That's what he's saying. And if I'm lifted up and you look at the cross and accept the cross, you too will have eternal life. You see it? Man. So now we got an Old Testament, New Testament, and they're saying the same thing way ahead of the guys nailing him on the cross. Okay, number six, John 12, 30, let's go 23, 32, and 33. John 12, three verses, 23, 32, 33, okay? And, and let's start with verse 23, okay? Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What hour? See, now when he says the hour has come, okay, what hour? What are you referring to, Lord? What he's referring to, drop down to verse 32, is this. But when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. 
that hour is in reference to the death. And so in verse 32, when he's saying, when I'm lifted up, in other words, when I die, I'll be the one to draw, little word now, all men. Do you know in another gospel, in this same context, just a little more information, these Greeks came to Jesus during this time? And they go, hey, we want to talk to this dude. Now, what do you think they wanted to talk to him about? Head stuff. They had another little philosophical question to dialogue. You know what he told them? Don't have time to see you now. Oh, I came for the Jews. Interesting statement. John doesn't say it. One of the other writers says it. Now, why is he saying this? Because once he's lifted up, he'll draw all men, Jews and Greeks. See, his mission was to do what he was supposed to do. By the way, way before the Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. What's our theme? The wisdom of God. Hmm. Let's keep going. Um, and then we have one more verse, right? Verse 33. So let me read it. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. So even Jesus, still not on the cross yet, is letting them know that the Son of Man must die on the cross. But we already know now by looking at prophecy, that's 800 years ago, B.C. So what's happening here? What, what, what is going on? It's not just merely these men nailing him on a cross. Something else is happening. And I want you and I to see this. It's more than just, oh, he's dying for sins. Number seven, Luke 12, verse 50. Luke 12, verse 50. And this is a reference, again, to his death. But he uses a different term. Luke 12, verse 50. Here it is. I got to find it myself. Um, yes. All right. But I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is completed. The baptism he's referring to there is his death. And so now we see these seven proof texts, one through seven, there's a lot more, shows that the man that nailed Christ to the cross, yes, they were involved, but there's something way bigger, way bigger, and it leads us to letter B. Second, there is something behind all of this. There is something behind all of this. It's letter B. Christ's death on the cross was no accident. It wasn't just a mere act of Roman soldiers going to nail this guy on, uh, up to a cross because Jewish priests said, crucify him. There's something else way bigger. There's a mystery, and we get to unpack it. Let me give you some more evidence. Under 1, B1, we've got the book of Acts. So the scriptures you want to write down, the verses, Acts 2, and then I'll read them. Acts chapter 2, 6 through 7, and 28, or 22 through 28. So two of them. Acts 2, 6 through 7, and verses 22 through 28. And watch this demonstration of what's happening. Okay, ready? Six through seven. Here it goes. When they heard, now this is Pentecost. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language, utterly amazed. In other words, like, what is happening here? They ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Okay, so they don't, something's happening. They're not there. They don't understand it. Now drop to 22 through 28. 
Listen to this. Our guy Peter now is addressing the cross or the, the audience about the cross, and here's what he says. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by, look at this, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, Old Testament again, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body also will live in hope. Why? Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. That word path means resurrection. So he's saying, you have made known to me the path of, or the resurrection of life. There was no resurrection when David penned that. That's an Old Testament quote. Peter grabbed it. And he's throwing it out to these Jews. And he's letting them know, God's involved here. The wisdom of God. You see it? All right, it's another little picture. Number two, stay in the same book, Acts 4, 27 through 28. Acts 4, 27 through 28. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles, or the Greeks, and the people of Israel. So you got Greeks and Jews now together in this city to conspire against the holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Now look at verse 28. It's a big verse. You did what your power and will had decided beforehand, beforehand should happen. In other words, Peter and John are arrested. They're on trial. For what? Preaching the cross. And now there's a prayer meeting in, in Acts 4. And guess what they're praying about? The very same thing that Peter preached in Acts 2. So now, you see what this means? This is what it shows. It sheds light on the Old Testament. It sheds light on the sacrifices in the Old Testament. It sheds light on the Passover lamb. I mean, do you see the funnel? The, it's just narrowing. He can't make it any easier. He's saying, look, the Passover lamb where God passes over those who have sinned because of the shedding of blood. It's a picture. God's involved. And all these Roman soldiers are, are minor B actors playing in this thing out. That's all it is. And there's a day coming, this is what it's showing, that the Son of God would be crucified on a cross. Now do you see why the Son of God is on the cross? The Father put him. That's amazing. And God the Father decided, because he's all-knowing, that man, before he was created, and we have it in, in other scriptures, before he was created, knew that man would fall, that man would be self-centered, that man had a pride issue. I'll be dealing with that one again. Uh, and that pride issue led him to want to live independently from God and sin. And as a result, the only way that man could ever get back is if God took the initiative. Christ went on the cross because the Father put him there. Let me give you the last quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 and 7. Now, that's an interesting way to look at the cross now, isn't it? We tend to just stop with the Roman soldiers. Now the Father's involved in this. 
And what does that say? First Corinthians chapter six or two, six through seven. Chapter two, six through seven. Here we go. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Politicians better listen up on this. Number seven. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. That's the very thing that we're talking about right now. That's what I've been saying at the beginning of this sermon. This is why Paul says, you know what? I'm going to glory and boast in the cross. Forget this other stuff. You fake teachers, look what you're boast. Look at them, Galatians. Look what they're talking about. But as for me, I got the red handkerchief. This is my stand. This is the truth. And this is what I'm preaching. Why? Let me give you a, now, let me give you a picture. Because a good friend shared with me, well, I shouldn't say a good friend, that the Bible's irrelevant, outdated. Let me share something. Here we are today, 2022, miserable sinners. Every one of us, every bishop, every preacher, every pope, every minister, nobody's excluded in this. There isn't a person alive today who is not a miserable sinner. I'm going to prove it. The whole human race, in fact, not races, race. The whole human race with all, the, you want inclusion? Here we go. All the ethnicities. All the diverse ethnic groups that combine the human race, they're miserable sinners. Everybody who was born since the fall of Adam falls in this group. Now watch. Life for us has been a misery for that reason. In fact, life is a trial. Life is a matter of disappointments. Life is a matter of a man or a woman doing things that he or she doesn't want to do and failing to do the things that they do want to do. Life's a struggle. Life's a moral problem to do right and wrong battling it, and want to do right all the time and can't. Life's a moral failure. Life's a moral difficulty to everybody. And here we are, 2022, and we're in the same condition that Humanity was a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. How about them apples now? And civilization has always been trying to put things right. In this country, we had FDR come up with the New Deal, and it buried us. That's history. And so you got these elites, men and women. You got the intelligentsia that handles the educational system, and they concoct schemes, plans, come up with a utopia, an ideological political position, looking for perfection. It's never happened in history. It never will because humanity are sinners. And they pass all these government bills. And we are the non better. We are as bad as we've ever been. Talk about evolution. 
You want to go that game where you evolve and get better and better and better? Not us. We've got worse and worse and worse. And though we're more educated than ever before, we're not more moral. There's one for the educational system. We're missing something. And we still don't know how not to sin. We still don't know how to live a clean life. Same old human predicament. Just the years change. Relevant? Oh, yeah. And Paul boasted in the cross because, ready? God had a plan for the predicament by putting his son on the cross, by him deciding that that's what he's going to do. And that leads us to letter C. Paul glorifies in the cross because God had a plan for this failing, sinful world. God had a plan for this failing, sinful world. And the cross is the center of that plan. In fact, add this scripture. I, don't, I didn't put it in your outline. I should have. It's 1 Corinthians. I'll read it. Chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. So let me read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 23 through 25 as an additional uh, text that's not included in your in your outline. Now let me read it for you, beginning at verse um, 23. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. There you go. And that's why Paul said, boy, I'm going to boast in this. I'm going to boast in this. Okay. So what does that say? You and I better love the cross. We better love it. It's the one thing that is the plan that gets us connected with fellowship and a relationship with the living God. But now let's go to Roman numeral two. All of our problems or all of our troubles result from our ignorance of God. Let me repeat it. All of our troubles that we have result from our ignorance of God. So here's what I want you to do. If you're listening online, just for a second, and those in person, I want you to close your eyes just for a brief second. I want you to look at those three crosses. Look at the one in the middle. Look at the Savior hanging there. Keep looking now. Don't see just Christ there alone now. Not after what we talked about. Keep looking. The Father is involved there too. With the prophetic statements that he made, he put his son there. He's there also. Now you can open your eyes. Do you see it? It's not just the Savior alone. So... The real problem we have with the world today is that men and women don't know that Savior personally. And it's funny that we've got individuals, and I get a kick out of this, that usually they're the popular writers that we read today, and all they do is speculate philosophically about the existence of God. Now, this is for them. They have no authority on their statements. 
Everything that they say about, oh, I think, I believe, I'm not sure, is simply what they think. They've got no authority on the matter. What do you mean? They don't know him. How can they talk about God? They can make statements, but they can't say, this is it, and write a book on it. How do you do that when you don't even know the guy? That's ignorance of God. So, what do we say to that? Why do they do it? They do it because they don't know him. Now, the only way they get to know him is if God reveals himself to them. Because of who God is and what he is, that's the only way a human being can know him, is if God reveals himself to the person. Not the other way around. The other way around is speculation. And that's no authority. You cannot want to debate somebody and say, well, I believe. Well, you can believe in something sincerely and be sincerely wrong with it. It's all about facts. And when you have suppositions and you can't prove them, just it's in your head, Man, and they have PhDs. That makes me wonder how smart they really are. So here are some questions that I have for people that take that position. Does your psychology really explain you to yourself? How about that? Read all the books you want on psychology. You talk about man and who he is. Go to Barnes and Nobles and see him. The row after row after row. My question is, read them all, and does it really explain to you who you are? Does all the modern knowledge that you gain really help you know yourself, know your neighbor, and give you understanding about life and death? Of course it doesn't. Our ignorance as humans, is appalling today. The more we learn, the more we see our ignorance in this area. So that leads us to, how does a person know God then, Pastor? Letter A. Here we go. We're going to see what God did, despite the promises and the plan. Look what he did for man. Here we go. Under A. In creation, you can see something of God. It's like a part. Not all of them. A part. Let me give you the text. We won't read it. Ro under A1, Romans chapter 1. And here's what you see when you read it. You see symmetry, balance, and perfection in the universe. Haven't you thought about, about this. Did you notice that the planets don't run into each other and explode? Well, how does that work? I mean, you look at how the planets are moving. There's balance. There's symmetry. There is perfection in the universe. It's not chaotic. Hmm. That's for man to look at and say, if you got a design... There's got to be a designer. You don't go to an art museum and look at a picture and say, oh, well, who? Uh, no artist did it. No, it had to be an artist. Look at the seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, winter. It doesn't go chaotic. You don't have spring in the fall. Winter in the summer? There's an organized entity here. So what God has done is given man a picture, the psalmist says it, of creation, getting him to think. It's got to be something bigger than look at this. How's this working? Letter B. In history, you can see part of God. In history, you can see part of God. 
Under B1, here's my suggestion. Read the history of nations. I'm talking about in the Bible, in the Old Testament, especially of the Jews. Read the history of nations, especially of the Jews, and you can see something of the hand of God in, in the Lord of history. You can see him protecting this group, moving them through. This is a common sense issue. You can have secular history. You don't even need the Bible. Watch this. How are these people that are so tiny getting through all of these obstacles? Egypt, the gun, and Israel wins. It's like somebody, the U.S. in Taiwan. And Taiwan becomes the winner. And the U.S. goes down. That's the play with Israel in the Old Testament. How does that happen? Let her see. In God's providential dealings with us. In God's providential dealings with us. You can see something of God. And let me give you the proof text. John chapter 1, verse 18. John 1, verse 18. Let me read it for you. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So, God reveals himself to man, not the reverse. This is why people do this philosophical spinning and narratives, because God has never revealed himself to them because they don't believe. So now they make up stuff, and they have no authority to do it. That takes us to Roman numeral three really quick, and we're out for part one. God has revealed himself in his son. There's the picture. God has revealed himself in his son, Roman numeral three. And Jesus made a comment, so let's take a look at it. Let me give it to you first. Jesus said, God the Father revealed his heart to us. God the Father revealed his heart to us. And the proof text that we're going to look at is John 14. I know you know it by heart. John 14, verse 6. John 14, 6. John chapter 14, verse 6, NIV version. Jesus answered. Watch the little word, the. That is huge here. I am the way. The truth the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, in other words, gotta go through the cross. And nobody gets to know God unless they go through Christ. You see it? You will never know God the Father as your Father except by Jesus, in particular, his death on the cross. And that's exactly the issue. And God, when Jesus said, oh, we, we haven't seen, where's God? Show us God. He goes, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father now. And Hebrews talks about it. In chapter 1, he's the identical representation of the living God, the Father. That's God revealing his heart to humanity by letting us see Christ. Now the issue becomes whether or not you're going to accept what he says. And one of those big issues that we are miserable sinners. And the only way we address the predicament is the cross. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, now we're getting another picture. It's not just Romans nailing up our Savior. 
I mean, they did it, but it's not merely that. That's not what put Christ on the cross. As we learn today, both Old and New Testament, what put Christ on the cross was you. What a revelation of your heart to us. You planning to put the second person of the Trinity on the cross so that everybody today, August 14th, 2022, has an opportunity to know you? No wonder it's not just Jesus hanging on the cross. You're there too, Father. You're showing us your heart. What a love. What a love by the Son. to want to glorify you and not in his flesh go through it, but does it so that a guy by the name of Thomas Ananias can have eternal life? No wonder Paul said, here's my handkerchief, here's where I stand, this is my position. For those that are believers this morning. Do you have that type of attitude? Do you see, maybe today is the first time you've actually seen the Father revealing his heart to this depth. Let God know that. Let the Father know that this week. In your personal time, reflect this week on the prophecies way ahead of time, revealing God's heart, showing that He was the one that put the Savior on the cross. And look what it shows about how He feels for you. If you're not a believer, one way or the other, the cross is the center of your destiny. And if you want eternal life, Jesus said it using that one little word, not a theological word, the, I'm the way, the truth, the life. That means everything else that claims to be like him is a fraud. But if you're tired of being miserable, you're tired of not understanding yourself, tired of not getting an adequate explanation of life and death from the intelligentsia, looking at hope in a political system that no political system can give hope, Paul said the Savior can. You need to come before him. Admit, admit that you're a sinner. That you got crazy pride. And you want forgiveness. And God's revealed to you today that he is the living truth, the life, the way. And ask him into your heart. And you can do that if you're sitting in the kitchen, if you're driving in the car, wherever you're at. There is no religious mechanism to do these steps. If you're in the bathroom right now, you can do it. God looks at your heart. I pray, we pray, that you make that decision. 
Holy Spirit again. Wow, thank you. And we're not even done yet. We're not even done. And now we've put another piece to the cross. May this week we reflect on the Father his actions in putting you Jesus on that cross for us thank you Holy Spirit for making it really easy to grasp in Jesus name we pray amen all right next Sunday part two there'll be more to this one and we'll just continue adding to what's behind the cross you ready to go home Nobody? You want another run? Part two? <laughs> no, I couldn't do it to you. No. <laughs> All right, let's end, and I will dismiss us. Father, help us to put your book ahead of any other book. Put your table ahead of any other table. Put you ahead of any other person that we claim to love. And help us this week to get rid of those weights that slow us down. Give us the legs to be able to run a race and persevere because we know the truth, the way, the life. Now to him who was able to keep us from falling, where there be grace, honor, and power, henceforth and forevermore, and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great week with the wisdom of God.